Hello and welcome to Startup Street. I'm Arundhati Ramnin and with me from the Delhi studio is Aishwarya Anand. And these are the top headlines from the startup world. SaaS startup Builder.ai bags $250 million in its Series D funding round led by Qatar Investment Authority. Including the new fundraise, the company till date has bagged over $450 million and its valuation has shot up by 1.8 times. Growth stage focused venture capital firm Physics Capital announces its first close of $50 million fund. The first close has reached $7 million and is on track to make its final close in 2024. The government says that the upcoming Digital India Act will strictly deal with misinformation and high risk AI to prevent user harm, and the first draft of the bill is expected by the first week of June. WhatsApp rolls out its latest feature allowing users to edit messages. Users can opt to change their text within 15 minutes of sending a message. The global update will be available to users in a couple of weeks. TikTok files a lawsuit challenging the state of Montana's new ban on the use of Chinese-owned app TikTok argues that the ban, which would take effect on January 1st of 2024, violates First Amendment rights of the company and its users. Those were the headlines that we're tracking for you this evening. But on what's brewing today, venture capital fund Fisis Capital has reached the first close of its maiden $50 million fund. Now, the first close is reached at $7 million and is on track to do the final close in 2024. Now, Fisis Capital will actively look to invest from its first fund by the third quarter of 2023 in startups looking to raise pre-Series A to Series B capital. Joining us now to discuss this further is Ankur Mittal, the partner at Fisis Capital, and with me also my colleague Aishwarya. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. You've reached the first close of your fund at about $7 million. We understand that this is an early stage fund. Give us a sense of the opportunity you see and what's exciting to you and where can we see the money going at this point? Uh, thank you and glad to be here. Um, I think, see, India is poised for uh, a lot of success when it comes to startup investing. I often say that we are where U.S. probably was 30 years back and even China was where 20, 25 years back. And that is why you see that even, you know, in the middle of funding winter, you just announced the Builder.ai deal and, you know, uh, there's still some more deals that are growing. Yes, there has been a slowdown, but what is important is that this is also the time to invest in startups uh, you know, like Warren Buffett says, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. So this is exactly the time uh, for a fund to start its investment journey. Uh, and therefore, our timing uh, to that extent, uh, we, we hope to believe that is, uh, you know, well timed. Uh, and that is the confidence that our investors, our early backers have shown in us. Uh, they have seen what we have done at a very early stage at uh, our uh, angel network platform called Inflection Point Ventures. They have seen the kind of success we have generated, which is almost unheard of, uh, you know, at the uh, early stage at which we used to come in. Uh, we are just taking the same investment philosophies, the same investment thesis, which is strong upfront due diligence and stronger post-investment support, and just carrying that to a pre-Series A to a Series B growth stage uh, through FISIS Capital. Now, uh, you know, the fund is sector agnostic, but you are looking at early stage deep tech closely. So how many such startups do you plan to invest in? And at what check sizes? Have you already identified some to invest in by Q3? Uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, if you're looking to deploy in Q3, it would be very, <laughs> it, it, it would not have been nice for us to not identify anything. So uh, deep tech is one of our focus, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, while we continue to stay sector agnostic because we believe that, uh, you know, often when you chase sectors and chase themes and chase trends, you often buy high, sell low, and that's generally not good for the fund. Uh, but uh, we have a strong, you know, we, uh, even uh, we have strong preference for businesses which have strong business unit economics, um, you know, uh, good path to profitability. Uh, and to that extent, you know, uh, deep tech, B2B SaaS enterprise, uh, these are all very good air consumer tech. These are all good areas for us to evaluate and invest. We are looking to make about 15 to 20 investments. Uh, and a significant part of the fund will also be carved out separately to invest in the uh, outperforming uh, startups of our fund as well. Uh, so we'll be making the first investments and then just keeping some dry gunpowder to double down uh, in the future rounds of, uh, of those startups which are doing exceedingly well. Um, we have a, a healthy pipeline. We have already identified uh, close to 10 startups. Uh, we, have we have started the due diligence of one of them. 
Uh, and if that goes through, then we can see deployment in Q3 onwards. All right, so we can see deployment in Q3 in some of the uh, companies that you've identified. Can you give us any names? Uh, too early to give names out uh, there. Also because we are under the NDAs and everything. All uh, right. As much intelligence. All right. And also now the fund was launched in 2022 with an investment of $50 million. You just said up to 50% of the fund size was to be deployed in backing proven winners from your IPV portfolio. So have you identified who those winners are going to be? Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, you know, one of the things you've done at IPV very well is just stay through the journey of the startup and the founders. Uh, and so you can say that we have been doing a very, very long due diligence on these startups. So while typically a due diligence is three to six months, our due diligence in some of these cases will be two years, three years long, uh, where we have, you know, very regularly seen how these startups work so that, yes, that list is ready. Uh, you know, we are constantly monitoring them uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, we will be timing it with the, their next fundings. Okay. Now, Ankur, apart from just, uh, you know, uh, giving them funds, you also plan to offer support to the startups you invest in. So how do you plan uh, to, you know, uh, bring this with founders to inculcate tight corporate governance practices and ensure a firm hold on cash burn? We are probably the only fund, uh, I, I could be wrong, but where all the four GPs are CAs and then they have gone and taken other qualifications. Uh, I'm an MBA, there is a CS, ICW, so on and so forth. Uh, with experience of working with global banks, global PE funds, as well as, uh, you know, l large, well-funded uh, unicorn fund, uh, startups. Now, what we plan to do is bring all of our experience as well as all the processes that we have built at IPV onto our uh, FISES. And one of the principles with which we started IPV is that the startups don't just need capital. They need a lot of other help. Uh, namely, you know, uh, they need to hire good talent, right person at the right place at the right time. Uh, you know, a, a very good, uh, you know, understanding of the business so that you can identify right. your lead lag indicators so that you can be proactive uh, and, you know, try to solve for problems before they actually become large. Um, and then generating a lot of business revenue opportunities and supporting in, you know, uh, further fundraise, working capital management. Right. Um, and uh, what we have done is we have built very deep relationships uh, in this space, uh, in this ecosystem. We have some very solid founder, uh, you know, uh, backers and, you know, uh, partners here. Uh, and we will be bringing a lot of that vision and wisdom into our investments. Uh, the founders understand that what they're getting is not just capital, but actually, uh, you know, partners who will be standing with them through thick right. and thin, guiding them through a maze called startup uh, growth journey. Right, Ankur. So it's not just the funding, but you're also going to be partners with them. All right, Ankur, we've completely run out of time on the show, but thank you so much for joining us today and we wish you all the best going forward. Which is all mine. Thank you. On Startup Street, on the hot seat today, we have the two-year-old bootstrap startup Tidy Up, which offers bag and shoe storage solutions that also help increase the longevity of these products. CNBC TV 18's Ritu Singh reports that the startup is now eyeing five times growth over the next couple of years. Take a look. Do you often find yourself struggling to find your keys and small items in your large bag? Do you stuff your shoes with newspaper balls to keep them in shape? Well, you're not alone. The need to find a solution to these everyday issues drove Paradhi Sekri and Vani Talwar Khosla to start Tidy Up in 2021. Basically, we started Tidy Up out of a personal need. So my partner and I both always had messy bags like most women have, and uh, we wanted to create a product to solve this problem for us. So we came up with an organizer, um, and once we came up with the organizer and we saw our customers' reactions and all, we realized that there are several problems that need simple solutions like this. The two-year-old startup provides solutions to organize and preserve accessories like handbags and shoes. They started with bag organizers made from recycled felt and later expanded to shoe pillow shapers to keep footwear in shape, but they didn't stop there. Now we have a lot more in the pipeline, which we are planning to add so that they you know, cater to every problem that somebody is facing in their own house so that it can provide a solution for every single uh, item in your house that you value. Vani spearheads the overall operations and is responsible for devising strategic business, marketing and growth roadmaps. But this is not her first rodeo. 
Ronnie is an entrepreneur who spotted a gap in a premium grooming concept in India and started the Powder Room Delhi almost a decade back, which is a premium mobile hair and makeup service before she went on to start Tidy Up. Paridhi is also a passionate entrepreneur in the fashion accessories and lifestyle industry and is the creative director of the Boho Bungalow, which is a home decor company. Delivering Pan India, the company soon aims to go international, targeting markets like the UAE and the US. Tidy Up has sold around 7,500 units of products to date and claims to have a user base of more than 25,000, 45% of whom are repeat customers. Interestingly, it's not just the metros where their products have found a welcoming market. There's a huge demand from the tier 2 and tier 3 cities. It seems like uh, that these products are only suitable for luxury market. Yes, the luxury market is growing exponentially. But uh, our market actually is, uh, we have so many clients that are coming who are carrying bags like generic jholas or office bags or women who are working from morning to night because they value functionality. The bootstrap startup became profitable within three months of operations. It has been recording a sales growth rate of almost 45% month on month and hit the 1 crore rupee revenue mark within the first one and a half years. As of January this year, the startup recorded one and a half crores in revenues. It now wants to grow fivefold over the next two years. This will mean expanding the channels it uses to connect to customers. We are basically a D2C brand right now and um, we're direct to consumer. We sell via website primarily and um, social media as well. That's also directed to our website. We do hold occasional offline sales and exhibitions and stuff. So currently we've sold 7,500 units. We only have about 70 to 80 SKUs. Uh, with the new segments that we're planning to go into, we are planning to increase the SKUs exponentially and uh, basically expand our market as well. In the next two years, hopefully, have offline stores in the metropolitan cities as well and the try before you buy I just told you about planning to expand that into um, the second and third tier so people can have more experience like experience with our products and um, be more aware of them as well so hopefully in the next two years we plan to grow our numbers by five times a flagship store is also on the cards currently we are basically online and um, I think it's been great for us and that is the way the consumer is shopping these days but because of the nature of our products eventually we do plan to um, have physical stores primarily in the metropolitan cities even currently about 40 percent of our sales happen in Bombay so we're looking at opening a flagship store maybe there in um, the coming year and um, hopefully similarly in a couple of other metropolitan cities in the next two years as well. This expansion will mean building a stronger marketing strategy, something the company has not really had to do so far. We've been very lucky that all our marketing has been very organic. We have been uh, valued and we've been even uh, given a shout out by celebrities who we've not endorsed for our company. In fact, 80% of our market till date has been all organic. Since we plan on launching new flagship stores in the coming next two years. So in order to that, yes, we do plan on uh, doing marketing much more than we have done till now. The founders say Tidy Up currently has enough positive cash flow to sustain its growth. Once the startup reaches a sizable scale, it may look for a strategic investor to partner with. But that may be some time away. In Bengaluru, Ritu Singh. Well, that was the story of Tidy Up. Now, moving on, it's been two months since the World Startup Convention, touted as India's biggest funding festival, exploded into a scandal. The aggrieved entrepreneurs are now in the middle of a legal battle, which they hope to win. Here's a report on what happened since the Indian Startup Ecosystem's Fire Festival. An angry crowd, police on the scene, and an alleged 100 crore scam. Those were the headlines from World Startup Convention that was held in Greater Noida on March 24th. It's now been two months since the first FIR was filed against the organizers, Luke Talwar and Arjun Chaudhary, 
Eager startup founders who thronged to the promised gala to meet top ministers, pitch to investors and meet corporate leaders have accused the organizers of breach of trust and financial fraud. Although I'm a lawyer by profession, I went to this World Startup Convention to promote my startup called Council Connect. On reaching the venue, I saw that there was huge utter chaos and there were a bunch of UP police just trying to manage the angry mob. We went ahead with uh, paying up uh, 48,000 rupees for eight classes. We took up a stall, we took up a sponsorship of 10 lakh rupees uh, and then uh, we put up a stall there where we invested roughly around 25, 20, 25 lakh rupees. 10 to 15 lakhs to 20 lakhs we've invested in developing samples and moving people from Bangalore to Delhi. It was a complete disaster. Um, what the UP police were doing was they were handing out sheets of uh, A4 papers to everyone who were asked to write their ticket numbers so that they can get a refund which is when we realized that nothing concrete is going to happen by doing all this and we need to go to the police station and register an FIR which we succeeded in and uh, sections 406 which is criminal breach of trust and section 420 which is cheating under the Indian Penal Code was registered against the organizers Mr. Luke Talwar and Mr. Arjun Chaudhary and the other 19 complainants who were there in the FIR are in the process of uh, 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 giving their opening statements uh, to the police. Um, we were also called by Mr. N uh, Honourable Ministers, Mr. Nitin Katkari's office uh, and we were given the go-ahead to take all legal action against the perpetrators. CNBC TV18 visited the Knowledge Park Police Station in Greater Noida where the FIR has been registered and met with Ashok Kumar, additional Deputy Commissioner of Police, who told us that the investigation is ongoing and the organisers have been cooperative so far. बर्ड इन्वेस्टमेंट समिट में जो थाना नालिश पार्क में फायर दर्ज हुई थी, इसमें जो कंप्लेनेंट्स हैं, नंबर ऑफ कंप्लेनेंट्स ज्यादा हैं, तो उन सभी के बयान दर्ज किए जा रहे हैं, और उनके द्वारा जो साक्ष्य उपलब्ध कराई गई है, उस साक्ष्य का हम लोग परीक्षण कर रहे हैं। इसमें कोई समय अवधि निर्धारित नहीं की जा सकती है जो भी साक्ष्य हैं उनका हम परीक्षण कर रहे हैं और साक्ष्य के आधार पर जो भी अपराध बनेगा तो उस आधार पर हम लोग विधिक कार्रवाई सुनिश्चित करेंगे The accused however continued to deny the charges claiming that the investors were there but they left after the commotion Arjun Chaudhary had told BBC that if it was truly a scam they would have run away with the money The affected attendees however believe otherwise it was all pre-planned, you know, everything so that they could defend themselves that, okay, we are genuine people and this happened. I mean, I, I can challenge none of the people who they claim to be present here, or many of them, I would say, would not be even aware of this kind of event happening. Now, if these things happen and these things go unheard and uh, no actions are being taken, it's just... You're just, uh, you know, uh, paving a way for such scams in future as well. The consortium of founders have sent a legal notice to Ankur Variku, who, along with other influencers, Prafil Billore, Raj Shumani, and Chetan Bhagat, shot promo videos for the World Startup Convention. For us, also, I believe that we should have done a little bit more uh, due diligence. But when people like Ankur Variku or uh, Prafil Bellore or Chetan Bhagat or any one of them for that matter, Raj Shamani, all of these people are renowned people. People uh, value their words. So when they talk about something like this or anything for that matter, people believe it. But now that trust is gone. Like for me, absolutely gone. In response, Variku has said that his reel on Instagram promoting the event was put out after due diligence. However, he claims that when red flags were raised, he asked the organizers to stop using his video. Variku now says that the organizers paid no heed to his request and the video continues to sit on the website of the event. Variku has also clarified that he is keen to work with the aggrieved and support them if needed. This case also raises questions on the accountability of influencers who are followed by millions and make money from content on social media. 
In fact, in March, the government released guidelines called endorsements no hugs for influencers. The rules ask celebrities and social media influencers to ensure they don't mislead their audiences. The rule also says that individuals must not endorse any product or service that they have not personally used or experienced or in which due diligence has not been done by them. This is Ashwari Anand for CNBC TV 18. And with that, it is a wrap on this edition of Startup Street from Aishwarya and me. Goodbye and many thanks for watching.